Good morning. Happy New Year. Oh my goodness, it's 2021. You guys excited? I am pumped. I'm going to need you to, I need you to like convince me that you are as well as pumped as me. I'm just saying. Come on now, it's 2021. First and foremost, thank you. I just want to say welcome. If it is your first time here, it's been a long time. If you're joining us online and you've never checked out Greenville First before, thank you and welcome and thank you for being here. My name is Brittany and my husband and I, Josh, are the lead pastors here at Greenville First and we are so excited for what this year is going to hold. Are you expectant? Because I am. I am proclaiming and just praying it into existence. This is going to be a great year. Amen? Amen. I just want to say also a merry belated Christmas for those of you who don't know. Christmas Sunday, we couldn't meet in person. That was not the plan. Our pastor jinxed us. I didn't tell the 9 a.m. that, but Josh had just said that week, guys, we made it. We only have one Sunday left. (laughs) And then a bajillion of us tested positive that week. I I just keep blaming it on him. But anyway, I, I, I am joking, but I do want you to seriously understand that was the hardest decision to do that. But we wanted to put everybody's safety first, knowing that you would go see loved ones, dispersing from here. We just didn't feel right about it. And so we thought that was the best decision. But I want to encourage you. I know we missed communion together on Christmas Eve, but this Wednesday, we're going to kick off our first corporate prayer gathering for 21 days of prayer. Don't miss it. We're going to have communion together. We're going to take a time and intentionally just go to the Lord and say, what will you have for me this year? What do you want me to do? I don't know about you, but I'm ready for new. I'm ready for new Brittany, new things. And I don't say that because I survived last year. I I wholeheartedly believe that I thrived. I am not going to refuse to let what's going on out there be my determinant to how my life is going to bear fruit. I'm not going to do it. But I still want new. I still want to continue to grow and learn and and, and know what all that he wants because I know that he wants what's best for us. And so can I encourage you just to be a part? I think if we're, if we're not careful, 21 days of prayer, for those of you who've done it with us before, it can kind of become that thing that we'd like check off the list. Yes, we did it. 21 days. Whew, where's my cupcakes that I fasted? Bring them back. Bring them back, right? But can we just challenge ourselves together as one family this, this year just to say, you know, fasting is hard. That's kind of the point. Giving up something sacrificially that actually does mean something to you. I remember when I was younger as a teenager, I would be like, yeah, I can fast. I'll fast spinach. <laughs> you don't quite get the discipline and the learning and the growth when you do it, when it doesn't mean a whole lot to you. But I promise you, God will show himself faithful if you just take this time and this season to join us. And, and you know, just on another note, I, we keep saying prayer groups, but some of you have, you've not been here at Greenville First. Some of you are, are new to where you haven't actually done a January with us. A prayer group is simply this. It, it sounds kind of awkward to be like, you want me to call my friends and pray on the phone? Like, I love Jesus, but even it's kind of intimate, you know, it's kind of awkward. I get that. Here's how simple this is. I get some girls on the phone. We say, hey, can we pray for anything going on in your life and your family this week? What can we pray for today? And guess what? On our app, on our website, every single day of of the 21 days of prayer, we have a prayer focus that you can focus on with your group. So it's not like this awkward, what do we pray for? There's a focus in each of us girls. We just rotate each day praying. We hang up. We go about our day. And you know what? There is something about building a habit for 21 days that you miss. There's a void in here as you grow, and God's going to change you through it. So be a part of 21 days. I am so excited for this series, Uphill Habits. And I don't know if you maybe have the same thought process that I did, but right when I hopped in and saw the title, it's like, Uphill. Are you kidding me? Didn't we just have a whole year of Uphill? You know, Uphill, it it gets a negative rap, right? Like, Uphill sounds like you're going through the worst season of your life and you're just waiting for the downhill. It's smooth sailing from there. But can I challenge you this morning? We're going to shift our brains this year. I know, I realize physically going uphill, you're going against gravity. If you're on an incline and you're exercising, oh, you're going to feel the burn like pretty much immediately if you're on an incline, right? It takes a different level of training. It takes a different level of endurance. I know all of that. It's challenging. Oh, and it's harder. But think about it. When I'm going uphill, first of all, my eyes are facing up. I'm focused. And I'm headed towards a destination that typically is a beautiful view, a waterfall. And what I've learned in my studying is this. 
Uphill may be more challenging, but it's worth it. And if we can just shift our habits and our disciplines this year with this mindset, I know that coming out of 2021, we're going to feel, look, and be equipped and shaped so much differently than where we are right now. And can we just flip to the opposite real quick? Like, honestly, downhill has this like smooth sailing, positive vibe to it. I don't know about your family, but my family, we have horrible, a horrible track history with things downhill. Okay, as I'm studying for this message, I start giggling to myself because I realize literally we have really messed up downhill so many times in my family. For example, young people, I don't know if your parents ever told you this. Mine didn't, just for the record. But if you park downhill and your gas tank is low, that's a bad thing. And what's so embarrassing about it is that I've done it twice. And I've had to call Josh twice. And one of them, we had to get a tow truck. And it was just because the gas ran out. See, you've been all fair warned. No one, and I hopefully, hopefully I don't forget again and do it a third time. But our son, this past Halloween, he was Sonic the Hedgehog, Cohen, for, for, for Halloween. We were trick-or-treating in the neighborhood. And when Cohen has a costume on, he is that thing. And it doesn't matter how much we convince him that, it, buddy, you cannot go down the hill at sonic speed. You are not actually the hedgehog. His three-year-old brother did it gracefully, smoothly, tapping the brake gently. And then there's Cohen, pff, downhill. It didn't end well. He, like, ate the asphalt, basically. And trick-or-treating was pretty much over for the night for our family. And there's that one time that I won't name the person's name in our family that thought he had put the truck in park really well. And when he was doing his work, he turned around and saw his truck rolling down the hill, smashed into a tree. But our family is so thankful for that tree because if the tree wasn't there, it would have gone in the lake. So seriously, when we talk about uphill, don't think negative today. Just think it's going to be worth it because downhill is just not always a cakewalk like everybody thinks. And spiritually speaking, in all seriousness, I know that doing an exercise on an incline, going uphill, it's harder. And I don't discount that. Spiritually speaking, when we have uphill habits, we're not always going to blend in with everybody else headed downhill. It's not the easy slope all the time. Many times, in fact, we're going to be pushing against what the world expects of us. We're going to be pushing against culture, things that are popular, choices that others may be making that we know we cannot make that. Those decisions are not always easy, and quite honestly, they're not always fun. But the fruit that will, that will bear from your life, the way that God will use you, if you can just begin to build and develop habits that will sustain you, not to survive, but to thrive. My prayer for all of us is that we'll be intentional about it this year. I don't know about you, but I would rather go uphill with Jesus any day than be cruising downhill all by myself. Amen? So let's be intentional this year. I am pumped. We are about to build some muscle this morning. You ready? I'm going to have you all over this place. If you are comfortable and able, can you just stand as we read God's word this morning? If you are home joining us online, I just want to take a minute to ask you to just change your posture. There's just something about it. If you are able to stand, do it. Change your posture. It's like, I'm not comfortable. I'm not getting, you know, getting so down in my chair. God, I'm just going to open my eyes. I'm going to open my heart. I'm going to open my ears for what you have for me this year that we can just receive it. This morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. And Jesus is speaking, and he says this, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink about your body, what you will wear, is not life more important than food and body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? How many of you know worrying usually subtracts time? It doesn't add time. And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field, how they grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even King Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Now hear me clearly, I'm switching to the message translation on purpose. I just feel like it's so relevant to where we are, especially coming out of last year. I want you to catch this, don't miss it. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, 
most of which are never even seen. Don't you think he'll attend to you? Take pride in you? Do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to, say it, relax. 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 Everybody go. <gasps> to not be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way that he works, they fuss over these things, but you, both, you know both God and, and the way that he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. In verse 34, give your entire attention to God, what he is doing right now, and don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. I know y'all don't do that. That's just me. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. See, our first uphill habit for the year is this. We're going to reverse our worry to worship. Can we just pray this morning? Jesus, we just thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you are in control. Thank you that we don't have to live a life of worry. And your scripture warns us so well right here. I pray that we would take heart this word today, that it would be a reminder for our year, and that you would sustain us, God. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I love the quote, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it never gets you anywhere. Isn't that so true? We just, guys, it's one of the strengths of the human race to worry, worry, worry. Why in the world would we kick off this series talking about worrying? I don't know about you. I had a worry-free year last year. Like, I had nothing to worry about. There was no problems in my life. <sighs> oh, my goodness. You name it, it probably happened. Between politics and divisions and health and is, is schools, are they going to be open or closed? Are we going to go on vacation? I'm going to go with a no, probably not. Not joking, some people lost jobs. Finances were all over the place. And some of these things, we, we talk about them as 2020, but most of them are trickling even into our lives still. It's affecting us now. And so what I refuse to do is allow us to go into 2021 with the same responses as 2020. It is a new year. I want us to be new creations. I want us to know what God has for us. New is the word. And I want us to have habits that are going to sustain us through it all. Did you guys catch in verses 28 that talked about the lilies growing in the field? They do not labor or spin. Isn't that so true about worrying? You get this idea in your head, and what does your brain do? Spin, spin. You ever heard anybody say, I couldn't sleep. My mind was just spinning all night long. And you worry and you worry. And like your 16-year-old got a motorcycle and he, he, he had an accident and he was paralyzed. They had to amputate his leg. And then you stop spinning for a second and you realize, whoa, he is only two. <laughs> Our brain, it just takes over, right? On this spin cycle, like the rocking chair. But you guys, we aren't accomplishing anything. And worry by definition, I didn't realize this. It truly means to choke or to strangle. And, and, and that's what we do to ourselves. When in really, we're not even in control of it anyway. We can't force the outcome. We can try. And unfortunately, we do, and we make a big mess, right? But we just strangle ourselves. I love this. It says, worrying does not take away today's trouble. I'm sorry, tomorrow's trouble. But it does take away today's peace. It strangles us. It takes our peace. And not only that, it's loud. It's so loud, it just takes over our brain and we can't hear anything else. Heaven forbid God actually be trying to give you direction and to give you a resolution to your problem, but we can't hear him because we're so consumed by our worrying. See, he's not surprised. He's given us this gentle warning in his scripture. He knows that this is a response that will be seen. He knows that it's going to be a natural thing for us to worry. And he says, don't Worry. Have you ever had an, ex or had an experience where, like, something looked really bad, and you're like, this is going to be a disaster? But then really, by the end of it, it turned out to, like, be no big deal at all. It totally worked itself out. But there's, like, this time between natural disaster, horrible, life is ending, world is over, to no big deal in the middle. That's a dangerous place. This is the place that we're going to be camping out in today. Because what we do during that place 
It's either going to damage us, it might hurt others, or it's going to bring life. And it's going to be pointing to the source of who can control it all anyway. See, I was thinking last Sunday, we were at my grandparents' house seeing them for Christmas, and our two boys, Jensen and Cohen, they're six and three, they were outside on the playground in the backyard. And Cohen comes running in, and he is like, Mom, come quick. Jensen has red all over his face. And I was like, red? And he was like, blood. Blood is all over Jensen's face. And so I'm like, oh, Lord, you know, boys, I'm not shocked. I'm not even panicked at this point because God only knows, right? So I get out to the playground, and Jensen runs up to me, and he's like, Mom, Cohen said I got red all over my face. And I start looking at him, and I'm giggling. And Cohen's like, Jensen, what did you do? And I'm like, Jensen, what did you do? He's like, I don't know. And I looked at Cohen, and I said, buddy, 10 minutes ago, your brother was in the kitchen eating the happy birthday Jesus cake with red icing. I said, Cohen, that's not blood, baby. But here's what I realized. Jensen knew he didn't fall. He knew he wasn't hurting, but he was thoroughly convinced because of his brother's worrying that he had blood on his face. And see, worrying doesn't just damage us, you guys. We bring people into the worry web all the time and it's contagious and it's like this panic frenzy. Look at social media how fast comments can spiral out of control. We have got to have a different response this year. I want my life to reflect Jesus, to push people uphill, not send them downhill, straight into the asphalt of worry. Okay, Brittany, so we hear you. We hear you, don't worry, we get it. How do we fix it? What what are we gonna do from here? We're gonna look none other into the story of Naomi and Ruth, one of my favorites. I don't know how much you guys realize, but Naomi was a worry wart. But her life lives a testimony of what God can do if we change the habit of worry. So just for a minute, I'm going to paraphrase. In Ruth chapter 1, you find Naomi and her husband, and they have two sons. And they are living in Bethlehem. Yes, the same Bethlehem as you're thinking. But this time at Bethlehem, a famine was coming. And Naomi was in a fit. She was freaking out, worry mode. We got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. We're packing up our stuff and we are leaving Bethlehem. I don't want to starve. And so sure enough, they all get their stuff and they move on to Moab. Shortly after they get to Moab, her husband dies. And so Naomi is left with her sons in this town and she knows no one. They are there for a period of 10 years. And in that 10 years, the sons marry two local girls from Moab, but also the two sons end up dying too. And so at the end of this 10 years, Naomi is left with her two daughters-in-law, full of misery, full of loss, full of emptiness, full of worry. And I can't help but wonder, is there anybody in the room today that may feel that way? Just you can relate to Naomi in some sort of way. We can laugh about 2020. There's all sorts of memes and jokes about it. But to you, it wasn't really funny. Because to you, you did suffer through some serious stuff. And you say, Brittany, I don't even honestly know how you can tell me not to worry. You have no idea what I've gone through or what I'm going through right now. I'm living a nightmare. But I'm here to tell you, there's a God who sees you. There's a God who saw Naomi. And in this moment, she's got to figure something out. Don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. And so towards the end of chapter one, she looks at her daughters-in-law and she says, hey, Ruth, Orpah, you guys have been so good to me, but I've got word that the famine is over and I'm going to go back home. Honestly, I've lost everything. You girls are young. Go and marry. Go start a new family. Go start a new life. Thanks for everything. Orpah goes, but Ruth, she's committed to staying with Naomi. She doesn't feel released from her. And she says to to Naomi, I'm not leaving you. I'm going back with you. And in one of the most famous scriptures of commitment, you probably have heard it in a wedding before, but Ruth looks at Naomi in chapter one, verse 16 and 17, and she says to Naomi, where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. And so I could just see Naomi being like, okay, girl, I got the point. Come on, let's go. She's not leaving me. And so they head back to Bethlehem together. And it's such an amazing visual. 
not just physically turning her back, but spiritually turning her back, Naomi is leaving a life of worry, anxiety, all of the loss and misery that she was in. And she's headed back towards Israel, the promised land, the place that God had wanted for them all along. And she's assured that she knows this God, he didn't forget about her. His plan is about to unfold and he's gonna bless her because of her obedience. This morning, our first point is this. Choosing not to worry, it doesn't mean that you're choosing not to care. Choosing not to worry doesn't mean you're, you're choosing not to care. See, I can't blame Naomi. The land was in a famine. As a mother, she's worried. And she wants to protect her family by getting them out. She cares for them. She wants the best for them. But I think so many times, have you heard somebody say, oh, I can't help but worry, I love them so much. I can't help but worry. Maybe we've said it ourselves. I can't help but worry. Like, I care about how this plays out so much. I'm passionate about this. I want this to happen. I want to see it all the way through. But you guys, there's a difference in being concerned and having empathy and then worrying yourself sick, causing everybody to go crazy around you and just making a mess of your life. When God has you in the palm of his hand, there's a difference. There's a line, there's a balance. And I think that we as humans, we like to rationalize worrying. Like, well, worrying's okay, as long as I care about it this much. It's like worrying, I get some gold medal if I worry the most out of everybody because it's supposed to show that I love and care so much more than everybody else. Why do we do that to ourselves? We're choking, we are strangling ourselves. I think that we justify wrong choices because we're in a difficult situation. It's like, well, I'm going through this, so I'm okay, I'm allowed to do this right now. But God says, if you make the right choice, if you trust in me, you go uphill against everything that's expected, that's when I will strengthen you. That's when I will bless you, even in the difficult circumstances. And here's what you may not realize about Naomi. She was worrying and she was taking it into her own hands, unfortunately. It kind of spun out of control, you guys. Because see, I keep saying famine, but the majority of the people in Bethlehem at the time, they didn't leave. It was God's people. It was his promised land. Most of them stayed and chose to live a life of trusting him and knowing that he would provide for them. Naomi chose to take her family and go. And more than that, when she got to Moab, you may not realize this, it was against God's law specifically that they are not to marry in foreign nations. See, the, she just lost sight of it all. Isn't that what happens when we get in the spin cycle? We, we, we lose our focus. We don't even know what's up from down anymore. We're like, where are we? What are we? We're all discombobulated. She's over in Moab and in just a mess. Loses her husband, loses her sons. And now she finds herself the lowest level of society. And that's a widow without any sons. All because her worry took over. And it's like when I worry, I get so convicted because I have found in my spirit that it's almost like when I'm choosing to worry, it's like me saying to God, like, you're not capable. You're not capable. I'm going to have to carry this because you are not capable to see me through when we know he is, right? And not only is he capable and greater, but he wants to offer us peace through it all. I love the promise in John 14, 27. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You guys, he's telling us, I'll walk with you uphill. I'll pull you up the hill. And not only that, I'm not going to get you through barely making it. I'm going to give you peace all the way through it if you'll just let me. And that's the hard part, right? My mima, she's like my hero. We were best friends. But that girl was a worry wart, okay? It, if I even mentioned that I was going on a trip, if I even talked about going on, oh, Lord, the airplane, don't get me all started on riding in the airplane. When I got my license, when I went to college, you name it, she was on the phone. Are you okay? How we doing? What we doing? How you doing? Are you okay? Me ma, we're great. Don't worry. And we picked on her about it all the time, and she knew, she knew she could have been better with that. But my mom loved the Lord. 
She was a woman of faith. And when she passed away, I was given her Bible. And I found in there this piece of paper that she had written her own personal Ten Commandments on. I think it was things that she like, knew she struggled with and she needed to go ahead and just like, write them down. But one of them said, thou shall not worry. And even as much as she loved the Lord, it reminded me, even the best of the best, we got to be reminded that we are not to do this on our own. We need to lean on the source. We need to stand on the foundation of what he offers to us because he is the only one who can do anything about it. But unfortunately, sometimes, like Naomi, the spin cycle takes control. And we start to fix it on our own. Our brain's like, da, 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 da. I don't know about you, I can fix some stuff quick. Doesn't mean it's always going to turn out awesome. See, if she had just trusted God, she had just trusted God. It, it wouldn't have meant that she didn't care. Of course she wanted the best for her family. But it would have shown her husband and her kids that she trusted a God who was in control. How much more would that have spoken as her legacy? How much more? She had just lost sight of him. Please don't fall into the lie in 2021 that worry is the first resort, that it's an okay response. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's okay. Let's go uphill this year. Let's grow this year. See, I love this part of the story. As we go into point two, choosing not to worry reaps a harvest for others to see Jesus. And you know what's fascinating to me is that Naomi and Ruth, for 10 years, they were in Moab together or around 10 years, whenever they got married, right? And I can't help but wonder, like, when did Ruth make this connection? But Naomi must have just been a worry wart that whole time. Her husband's gone, her sons are gone. But in this moment where they flip the story, and Naomi says, I'm going back. This is not just a physical representation, a journey, but also a spiritual one. And do you know, in the commentary that I was reading, it said that journey from Moab to Bethlehem all the way back was mostly uphill. Isn't that amazing how God is in the details? It's mostly uphill. And you know what that teaches me? The path is not always the easiest one, but it will be worth it. She knows that she's gone about it all wrong. But here's what I love. She also knows there's not enough room up here for worry and faith. We have to decide which one gets to live there. And Naomi is tired of it being worry. And for her, she is making a declaration today that faith has got to be in her mind. Moving forward, and here is where the reaping of the harvest comes in, the fog has just been cleared. Naomi has just shifted a life, a habit, She's no longer worrying anymore. She's got her focus back on the source. And guess who is watching? Ruth. See, what you may not realize is people in Moab over here, they're not in God's land. They're not worshiping the God of Israel that we know. They're worshiping gods, false gods, plural gods. And for 10 years, Ruth never told Naomi, my God will be your God. Hmm. But in this moment where Naomi has made a life shift, Ruth sees something different about her. And I know that at wedding ceremonies, we're like, oh, your God, my God, love, love, love. But don't you miss the powerful part of the context here. Ruth has just told Naomi, your God, that God that you are talking about, that you serve, who's given you a confidence like I've never seen, your God will be my God now. Ruth is also turning her life spiritually to the God, the one and only God who can sustain us. And it's so powerful there that you guys, do you understand this? We live in a life of worry. When we do, it just fogs everything for everybody else to see. When you live in a life of worry and you respond the same at the grocery counter or on social media or you're in panic frenzies all the time, people aren't seeing Jesus. Isn't that what Satan wants, though? Isn't, isn't that what he wants? He wants us to blend in, be heading downhill with the rest of them like chickens with their heads cut off. He doesn't want us to be living in a life of peace. Oh, no, that would set us apart. That would look different to people. They might want that. And in this moment, Ruth's life has been changed forever because of Naomi's obedience. Our life should make others want our God. It should be a clear view for them, not going further from God, but running closer to him. Not, not running to Google and becoming a doctor overnight, because we do it. 
We are experts of everything, right? No. It's just getting on our knees and saying, God, I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why this is happening to me. I don't understand why this is so hard when it's so easy for everybody else. Why is their marriage awesome? Why can they have babies? Why, Why do they have a job? Well, what about me? Why am I going through this? Well, they, they had COVID and they're okay. Why wasn't my family? But he sees you. And here's the thing. Worrying is not going to matter. It's not going to do anything but damage you. Through the storm, through the valley, let your life be on display for others to see your response. This is when he can use you. This is when you're the vessel that everybody is seeing. And here's the thing. Giving it to Jesus and not worrying about it, that takes courage. That takes trust. That takes repetition over and over and over. You know what? I can, um, I can walk down a hill on my cell phone, right? I don't tell my feet what I need to do. They just do it automatically because downhill's easy. But if girl's about to have a hike, I'm not trying to be on Instagram going up the rock. I'm going to put that away, and I need some arms to help, right? I need some power in these elbows. It takes work. It takes repetition to make it to the top. But you guys, it'll be so worth it. And as the story begins to unfold, they get to Bethlehem, and Ruth obviously is going to provide for them because Naomi's older. And Naomi says, hey, Ruth, go to the field of Boaz. You can pick up the grain and gather it all day, but go to the field of Boaz because Boaz was a relative of my husband who had passed away, and I know that it'll be safe there. And so Ruth goes, morning to night. She is gleaning in the field, picking up the grain, minding her own business, doesn't know anybody. Well, Boaz, the owner of the field, he actually had been out of town. He comes back into town. We're going to flash forward a couple chapters. And he says, who is the new girl? Who's the new girl in the field? And the supervisor is like, oh, that's Ruth. Let me tell you about Ruth. Her hardworking spirit, her attitude here, So humble, so kind. Ruth didn't carry herself around that field like a victim of worry. Oh, I don't know anybody. I left my land. My husband died. Oh, my goodness. All of those things are super important. But they didn't define who she was. And you know what the crazy thing is? Ruth had no idea she was under inspection. She was doing her thing, living her life. Can I tell you, whether you like it or not, people are watching And we've got to decide, is our life going to reap a harvest for others to see Jesus? Is it going to reap a harvest of just worry and panic? And that lady, she's just a worry wart, freaking out all the time, inconsistent, up and down, roller coaster. There's a steadiness that comes when we trust the Lord. And in this moment, I can't help but just think about Psalms 34, 4. It says this, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. Some of you need to hear that today. Some of you need to write that on an index card and stick it to your mirror. I sought the Lord, and he delivered me. And I can't help but wonder, is this the disposition that Ruth is in? Just so assured that this God of Israel is going to guide her every step of the way. Even when we don't feel it, you guys, he's watching. He's working in our lives. But let's don't fog the view for others to see him. As the story ends, Ruth finds favor in Boaz, or sorry, yes, Ruth finds favor in Boaz. They get married and they have a baby. And I think Naomi in this moment just sits back and realizes, oh my goodness, I was just so sad and lost and in worry. And I have just risen up to one of the most famous women in Israel with this grandson that Ruth and Boaz have given me. Can you guys imagine if she had stayed in Moab? Oh my goodness. What she would have missed out on, strictly out of disobedience. See, I think when Naomi puts her worry away, she realizes that her life is on display. That's when she becomes confident in her source. And that's our third point this morning as we close. Choosing not to worry shows that you are confident in the source. And please don't mishear me this morning. If somebody says, what was church about today? I don't want you to tell them, well, yeah, she preached about don't worry. We're talking about don't worry. 
But that's surface. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of being on the surface. I'm ready to go uphill. I'm ready to go deeper. And I'm ready to give you an action step. Because here's what that means. If I am confident in my source, that's when I have the power and the motivation and the trust and the strength, not just to not worry, but to reverse it to worship. Let's go deeper. Let's take our worry. Let's take the strangling moment and let's give it back to Jesus. Let's give it back to him. Because as the story wraps up, our worrier Naomi, she is ending the story worshiping. Worshiping a God who saw her every step of the way. And it hit me. Hmm. We're worshiping. Whatever we choose, we're worshiping something. See, worry It's just worshiping the problem. Worry is just worshiping the problem. I don't want to worship the problem. I want to worship the source who can fix the problem. And wherever life may find you today, I just want to read this over you. In Jeremiah 17, may you have confidence in the source. Here's what it says. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought. 2020, right? It never fails to bear fruit. Our bearing fruit is not dependent on what's going on. We have a choice to make. We're either going to worship the circumstances or we're going to worship the one who can fix them and change them and make them better for us. I'll never forget living in Florida. After we were married, Josh and I lived in Florida for about 12 years. And we came to this point where we knew we had to leave. Transition was coming. But you guys, I would love to tell you I knew the plan. That was it. And from the time that we knew we were supposed to leave to the time that we actually found the answer from God, that period was seven months. And me and Josh had a choice to make. Were we going to choose to wake up every morning worrying about what the day would hold or what was going to happen or what we were going to do and call our friends and talk about it a whole lot more than we pray about it? Or we could choose to get up every morning, lay it at his feet, and say, God, we're going to worship you. We're going to worship you. We're going to worship you. We have no clue. We don't know your timing. We have no idea. Hey, God, we resigned our jobs and our house is on the market but we're going to worship you. And here's what's crazy about that. Nothing about that makes sense. But can I tell you, we had peace every single day. Like, I don't remember a day where we were like physically stressing out. And I don't say that in in an arrogant way. I say that in a way that it took work. Are you kidding me? If you know me, I am type A, OCD. I need my plan. But I realized in the beginning of that seven months, worrying was getting me nowhere. What it was gonna do, what it was gonna cause tension in our house with our kids. It may have divided our marriage. But I declared that day, "Mm -mm. we're gonna worship. We were more unified than ever. We were closer to God than ever. We were dependent on Him and we had peace. See, at the end of Ruth, these women are looking at Naomi in chapter 4, verse 14, and here's what they say to her Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Check out how amazing your God is. This baby that Ruth and Boaz had, they named it Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. And as the lineage goes down, you may know, it leads straight to Jesus Christ himself. See, Naomi was a great, 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 great. Can we just let God write our story? Can we commit to 2021 that his plan is gonna be so much better than any worry web that we can conjure up in our spin cycle, you guys? And there's more. Can, did, you, did you make the connection? When Naomi went back to Bethlehem, and the lineage of Christ was started there, she's the very reason why Joseph and Mary had to go back to Bethlehem to register before Jesus was born. For unto us a Savior is born. Wow. What amazing fruit could happen when we just reverse our worry to worship and we let God 
in the driver's seat of our life. Will you bow your heads all over this place today? See, we got a choice to make. We can choose this year to say, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna control it. I'm gonna hold it. And we'll let worry win. Or we can choose this year to say, God, I'm just gonna worship you. The one and only source who can actually make a difference anyway. But I cannot help but wonder. If there's people in this room, if there's people at home watching, wherever this service may find you, where you're like, Brittany, I hear you. I hear you. I love that you say, don't worry. Because quite honestly, that's, what I, that's the only thing I do all the time. But I don't know this God. I don't know this Jesus that you're talking about that gives you a hope like that. How can I be confident in a source that I don't even know? Can I tell you that that baby in Bethlehem, he grew up. And when he was 33 years old, he died on a cross and he rose from the grave so that you didn't have to live in sin and worry and shame and fear anymore. His grace is sufficient for you. And so this day, why not start the year off fresh? If that is you and you're saying, I need him in my life, I don't have him, I need to start over. Would you just raise your hand? No one's looking around. Thank you. You can put it right back down. Thank you. What an incredible decision to make at the beginning of a new year. What a fresh start. And those at home, I'm so grateful for a God who can work in your living room. All over this place, will you just repeat after me? Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart today. I'm tired of worrying, trying to figure it all out. I need a new hope. Be my savior today. And I'm just gonna pray, because I know there's others in here who you are a believer and you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, but if you're honest with yourself, worrying took its toll on you last year. Can we just make a commitment in prayer today for freedom? God, we just thank you so much, Lord. God, we thank you that you are in control. God, we thank you for this reminder from your word, Lord, that you have got us. You have got us, even with all the question marks that have followed us and the unknowns and the I don't understands, God, you've got a peace that passes all understanding, God, and we ask for freedom today. God, we commit 2021 to you to be one of not worrying. And when those times come and the spin cycle begins, God, that we would hit stop and we would reverse it to worship. We thank you for who you are in our lives. We thank you, God. You are our Redeemer, Lord. And we thank you for what this year is gonna hold. In His name we pray. Everybody said. <laughs>